here up on the screen is the newest image that's come out from NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. The beautiful Wolf Rayye star. Amber, can you tell us a little bit more about this image? Sure, I think anytime we're talking about astronomy, it's always important to think of the concepts of context and scale. You know, those of, of us that aren't used to thinking about these things every day, and even those of us that are, uh, need to be reminded. And so what we're seeing in this beautiful new image, at the very center is a star. The light from that star has been traveling through space for about 15,000 years, it's 15,000 light years away, uh, until it hit the detectors on the telescope. And the material that you're seeing around the central star that looks like dust is dust. Uh, and so at the end of a star's life, it, they shed their outer material, their outer layers out into the rest of the universe. And I think this is one of the most beautiful concepts in all of astronomy. This is Carl Sagan's stardust concept. The fact that the iron in your blood and the calcium in your bones was literally forged inside of a star that exploded billions of years ago. And that's what we're seeing in this new image. That dust is spreading out into the cosmos and will eventually create planets. And um, this, is, this is how we got here, in fact. Wow, so beautiful. Maka, can you tell us a little bit more about why this is important? Sure, so these wolf Rayet stars, they are really big and bright and incredibly hot, so they are really bold objects. This one in particular is 30 times the mass of our sun, so it's very big, and when they are, we know that the stars that are this big, they live fast, they go through the, uh, you know, different stages in very quick time, and some of them, only some of them, end up being this wolf Rayet to later on become a supernova. So it's really uh, unique that we can see and study this star with this detail, with JWST, for the first time in the infrared. So as Amber was saying, this star has shed a lot of gas, and we're talking 10 times worth our sun. So it's really a lot of material going into space. And as it goes away from the star, all this gas cools down. When it cools down, it forms dust. And that dust, when it gets colder, it glows in the infrared, which is exactly what James Webb looks at, the infrared light. So what is infrared light? It's, it's, it's a type of light we don't see with our eyes. With our eyes, we see visible, we see the reds, the blues, and the greens. Infrared is a light, it's a, the fraction of the light that is really sensitive to temperature. Everything that has a temperature from our bodies to a piece of ice emits in the infrared. And so with it, we can observe really a, in a very advantageous way, a stellar object. So we can, there are three main advantages. advantages. You can f see through the dust and the gas and then really see, for instance, the stellar nurseries that are forming behind. We can also see cold objects like cold dust and colder planets, and we can look back in time. And this is um, one of the main reasons why we built web was to actually look at the very first objects of the universe. So when those objects form about Thir more than 13 billion years ago, they emitted light. Light is a wave, and as it travels through the universe, through the expanding universe towards us, it expands, like literally like a slinky. So it moves from the visible light to the infrared light, and then Webb can see it, as we'll see for the first time with his details. So we've never seen that before. It's really exciting. Oh, definitely. Thank you so much. So this image is just one of many that we've seen since we've started science operations last July. The web mission has been so successful and has far exceeded our expectations. Let's take a look at some of these other stunning images. Starting with the solar system, Stephanie, can you tell us a little bit more about this image? Absolutely, um, but before I get started, I wanna wish my dad a happy birthday today. <laughs> Okay, back to the science. Okay, so this is Jupiter. Uh, this is actually the Jupiter system, and it is one of my favorite images that we've released because it's a lot closer to home for all of us. Um, we will be observing the solar system with the James Webb Space Telescope and have been doing so. And this was our first science image that we released of Jupiter and its system. What is so fantastic about this image is in order to image something as big and bright as Jupiter, but also in the same image capture the faint rings, tiny satellites, and all the intricate details of this planet, 
means that we had to have a factor of 10,000 in contrast. So something 10,000 brighter than like Jupiter compared to its own rings and satellites. So um, it really shows the capability of JWST in observing things in our solar system. Everything from the aurora on, the both, on either pole of this, of, of this planet, the great red spot, which is white in this image um, because of the colors that we chose uh, to depict it, um, and all the fantastic detail of the weather in, in, in the atmosphere of Jupiter. We're gonna be observing everything in our solar system that JWST can point to, um, from near Earth asteroids, uh, comets, interstellar objects, all of the planets and their satellites to the farthest reaches of our solar system, including our favorite minor planet, Pluto. <laughs> so lots more to come. Thank you. And Nicole, we've also been able to learn more about exoplanets or planets outside of our solar system. Can you tell us a little bit more how Webb is studying exoplanets and really what we've learned so far? Yeah, absolutely. I, I wish we had as beautiful pictures of Jupiter as we did of these distant worlds, but they're very far away. Uh, so we have to be kind of creative in the techniques that we use to study these distant exoplanets. And so JWST is you know, a provider of these amazing images, but it also is really great at doing something called spectroscopy. So all that really means is we're taking a rainbow of light and breaking it down so we can measure the chemical fingerprints of, of objects in the universe. And so with exoplanets, one way we can study them and study their atmospheres is by looking at ones that pass in front of their star. And then when that happens, um, as shown in the animation, uh, what we can see is starlight blocked by the planet plus its atmosphere. So we can break down what light gets filtered by the planet atmosphere to reveal what the atmosphere is made of. And so using this technique, we've already made some great discoveries with JWST. So this is real data that you're seeing here. Again, it's not a pretty image. The, the background illustration is just an illustration of, of a giant gaseous Jupiter-sized planet, but just 700 light years away. Um, you know, just 700, uh, <laughs> so it's pretty far. Um, but the really neat thing about this is we see this massive bump in the data, and what that is revealing is that the planet plus its atmosphere is blocking extra light from the star, and that tells us this whopping signal is carbon dioxide in that exoplanet atmosphere. And the reason this is so groundbreaking is because it's the first definitive detection of carbon dioxide outside the solar system. We know about Jupiter and Saturn and all these planets, and we can tell their atmospheres, but now we need to learn about all these other worlds because there are over 5,000 of them out there. <laughs> Wild. And another thing I've been really excited about is what we've been learning with galaxies. Maka, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Of course. So all planets and stars, they sort of live in neighborhoods, and those neighborhoods are galaxies. So I like to think of galaxies as the building blocks of our universe. There are many of them, and this beautiful image shows a group of galaxies that are sort of having a cosmic dance, I like to think about it. So they are interacting with each other as they get close. And as you can see here, the gravitational pull and the neighborhood, so they get so close that it's a very slow and a very intense process that really distorts the galaxy, creates plumes, creates beautiful structures, but it also does create new stars, and it, it really creates the possibility of having, from two different galaxies, a, a new galaxy that could be maybe a big elliptical. So by the end of this process, you will either have a completely new galaxy, a, another galaxy that can go away, and essentially really understand how they form and evolve. And at the center of each of these galaxies, we have a supermassive black hole, which is also I'm very, I mean, it's very interesting, um, to me, because supermassive black holes, we really don't know yet how they are formed. There's a lot of discovery space in there, and uh, interaction is a very important part of galaxy evolution because we think all galaxies undergo one of these processes at least once in their life. So it's really driven the universe we see today. So yeah, it's one of my favorites, essentially. <laughs> 